in 1946, he was the world's most famous scientist and considered by many one of the smartest men that ever lived. For the last 20 years of his life, he turned down honorary degrees. Yet, on May 3rd of that year, Albert Einstein made an exception and accepted an honorary degree from Lincoln University. Founded in 1854, Lincoln was established to educate male youth of African descent. In 1946, the world was still in shock over Germany's extermination of 20 million people, 6 million of them Jews. Himself Jewish and forced to leave Germany, Einstein said that he could no longer remain silent and must speak out against the disease of racism. In 1946, America itself was one of the most legally racially segregated societies in the world. The most devastating effect of America's racial policies had been on denial of educational opportunities to African Americans. By going to Lincoln University, Einstein hoped to send a message to American society. Unlike most of his public speeches, the press ignored his presence at Lincoln. President of Lincoln University, Horace Mann Bond, presented Einstein with the honorary degree. In 1946, no man knew more about the injurious effects of slavery and segregation than Bond. He concluded from his years of research that schools were not presently equipped to educate African American children. He believed it would take committed and compassionate teachers to restore their confidence, and those who sought to educate black children needed to know the history of African American education in order to improve their effectiveness. In 1619, a Dutch ship delivered 19 Africans to the colony of Jamestown, Virginia. These new arrivals worked as indentured servants for a period of time before gaining their freedom. Despite servitude, they could learn to read and write. With the growing need for labor, the colony of Virginia passed a law in 1662 making persons born to a slave of African descent a slave for life. No longer could black indentured servants earn their freedom after a period of time. With the increased number of persons of color who could read and write, whites became uneasy. They feared literate slaves could falsify passes to aid in their escape. Or worse, they could read materials that encouraged them to rebel. In 1720, the colony of South Carolina passed one of the earliest laws against teaching slaves to read or write. The fear of whites proved to be true in 1822. Gabriel Prosser and DeMarc Vasey, both literate African Americans, attempted to organize an armed revolt. In 1830, Nat Turner, a literate slave preacher, organized and carried out an armed revolt. These two incidents caused southern colonies to strengthen their anti-literacy laws. In 1776, many educated freed and enslaved blacks joined the American Revolution. They had hoped to gain the rights Thomas Jefferson so eloquently wrote about in the Declaration of Independence. Quakers, the first whites to do so, formally called for an end to slavery in 1688. In 1770, Anthony Benezet, a Quaker convert, opened the first Quaker-sponsored school for children of African descent. In 1831, Prudence Crandall, a Quaker, along with James Fortin, a black abolitionist, opened a school for young women of color. Townspeople burned the school rather than see black children educated. Crandall was arrested and tried. Her case was reversed on appeal in 1834. In 1849, Horace Mann, a United States Senator before Congress said, Sir, he who denies children the acquisition of knowledge works devilish miracles. 
In 21st century America, few men or women would deny a child the chance to read, nor would they burn down a school. Yet today, our schools continue to work devilish miracles, denying children an education because of their color. Most would say, this is not true. Yet today, the average 12th grade African American student can read no better than the average 8th grade white student. Only 14% of African Americans are reading at their grade level compared to 41% for whites and 38% for Asians. Many scholars believe that one of the most significant obstacles is the belief that African Americans are intellectually less capable than whites. This belief is strongly held by both whites and blacks themselves. Scholars believe that in order for any student to perform at their best, teachers must believe they can learn, and students themselves must have confidence in their abilities. These scholars believe that expectation is one of the most powerful determiners of academic performance. Men can, as William James, the great 19th century philosopher said, alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. As you think, so shall you be. How did the widespread belief that blacks could not learn as well as whites come about? To make a contented slave, you must make a thoughtless one, darken his morale and mental vision, and annihilate his power of reason. It must not depend upon mere force. The slave must know no higher law than his master's will. Frederick Douglass. Douglass came to understand early in life what it meant to be able to read. One day he heard his mistress read the Bible. Her words aroused him in a great desire to learn. She violated the law and began teaching him to read until her husband stopped her. Douglas soon came to believe that knowledge was the white man's power. And if a black child acquired knowledge, he became unfit to be a slave. Douglas came to understand why whites not only enforced laws against teaching slaves, but also destroyed their culture and family ties. He observed while slavery was sometimes enforced by the whip and gun, its primary means of control was the acceptance by the enslaved of their inferior position. To look upon whites as persons of superior abilities and themselves as inferior. In this way, a few whites could control, with little physical force, a large captive population. Once Douglas began reading, he realized he had the same abilities as whites. He no longer felt, thought, and acted like a slave. He began teaching others. Thomas Jefferson professed to be a great lover of freedom. In the Declaration of Independence, he wrote that all men were created equal and have the right to liberty. Despite his egalitarian beliefs, he also wrote in the notes on the state of Virginia that Africans, as well as Indians, were lesser men. Comparing them by their faculties of memory, reason and imagination, it appears to me that in memory they are equal to the whites, in reason much inferior, that in imagination they are dull, tasteless, and anomalous. In this way, Jefferson and others justified slavery and perpetuated the idea of their inferiority. Most African Americans, since they were slaves, dared not contest Jefferson regarding his belief. One man did challenge Jefferson. Benjamin Banneker was one of a small number of freed persons of color in the state of Maryland soon after the American Revolution. His grandmother taught him how to read and write when he was a child. Early in life, he developed an interest in mathematics and mechanics, preferring books to play. His notes and other historical records reveal that he became accomplished in mathematics, clock making, 
astronomy, and surveying. In 1791, Banneker assisted Major Andrew Ellicott in surveying the new federal city that would become the nation's capital. In 1792, Banneker published an almanac based on his own calculations. Banneker was long aware of Jefferson's views about blacks. Proud of his African heritage and confident in his abilities, on August 19, 1791, he wrote Jefferson. He cordially reminded Jefferson that during the Revolution, he, Jefferson himself, called slavery an evil. How could Jefferson now support an institution he said he abhorred? Banneker closed his letter, citing some of his accomplishments to Jefferson, proof of the abilities of a person of African descent. Jefferson wrote Banneker back, briefly thanked him for his letter, wished his race well, but failed to answer Banneker's questions regarding slavery. Jefferson, like most whites, quickly cast aside the contributions of African Americans in winning independence from England. He and others also cast aside revolutionary ideas of freedom and equality for all. They became preoccupied with moving to the fertile lands west and creating more wealth for themselves. Winning the revolution opened the way for wealthy planters to move their slaves to the territories that would become Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. These lands provided richer soil for cotton cultivation. To clear this virgin land, plant and cultivate the cotton, black slaves became even more valuable and indispensable. Between the end of the Revolution and the Civil War, the slave population exploded in growth. The planter class justified even more the enslavement and the intellectual inferiority of persons of African descent. By 1860, the eve of the Civil War, anti-literacy laws prevented over 90% of African Americans from reading or writing. Yet, the enforcement of these laws failed to stop the education of a number of African Americans. They and their descendants would provide the leadership to the masses of uneducated African Americans when freedom came. Like Benjamin Banneker and Frederick Douglass, they found a means to obtain an education in the face of opposition. During and after the Civil War, this educated elite would join forces with the masses of uneducated African Americans. Together, they built the first universal public education system in the South. Like Douglas and Banneker, educated African Americans viewed reading and writing as the primary means to liberation and as an act of resistance to slavery. Oh, Civil War opened the way for the mass education of African Americans. From the beginning, their thirst for education surfaced. And the idea that slaves were docile and accepted slavery proved to be false. Whenever the northern armies were nearby, slaves ran off the plantations and headed for their lines. Early in the war, most Union Army commanders forced them back. Not General Benjamin. Butler. In 1861, he refused to return slaves at Fortress Monroe, Virginia. He called them contrabands of war and paid them to work as military laborers. As the Confederate Army proved difficult to defeat, other Union generals adopted Butler's policy. In 1862, black regiments were organized and fighting. In army camps, many of the literate black soldiers taught their brother soldiers and contraband how to read and write. I saw aged colored men, slaves from their mother's womb, come into our camp 
as into cities of refuge. I have seen old men pass the meridian of life, yes, well on towards its end, after a hard day's work in the company's kitchen, lying prone upon the ground before the campfire with spelling books in their hands, painfully trying to fasten in their names and outlines of the letters of the alphabet. Benjamin Harris, a Union general, and later President of the United States. Northern missionaries followed the Union Army South, lending assistance to newly liberated slaves. One of them was Lewis Lockwood of the American Missionary Association. Soon after he arrived in Fortress Monroe, Virginia, the black children there told him about Mary Peek. Like Banneker, Mary Peek was from mixed parentage and a freed person of color. During slavery, she defied the law and taught both slave children and adults in her home. Lockwood recruited Peek as a teacher. On September 17, 1861, she became the first to start a school for liberated slaves during the war. Her school was located near where the first African indentured servants landed in Virginia in 1619. Peek continued to teach even while confined to her bed, dying in her home of tuberculosis in 1862. Called a saint by Lockwood, he wrote a book about her life. Mary Peek was the beginning of a courageous band of women and men who came south during and immediately after the Civil War. One of them was Charlotte Fortin, the highly educated and cultured daughter of James Fortin. While she had more in common with the educated whites of the North, she also had an underlying commitment to the betterment of her uneducated brothers and sisters. She writes in her diary, the first day of school was rather trying. Most of my children are small and consequently restless. But after some days of positive, though not severe treatment, order was brought out of chaos. I never before saw children so eager to learn. She also describes her warm meeting with Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, the white leader of the 54th All Black Regiment and writes about singing with soldiers of the 54th two weeks before their ill-fated charge on Fort Wagner. In this battle on July 18, 1863, many of them were slaughtered along with Colonel Shaw. Charlotte Fortin was joined by Harriet Murray, a group of women from Haverford College and others. The Haverford College women called themselves Gideon's Band, after the warrior prophet. They saw themselves engaged in a religious calling, the education of 8,000 African Americans on sea islands of South Carolina. Their calling and their courage helped prove to a doubting nation that African Americans were ready for freedom and wanted to learn. This experiment during the war provided the impetus for the passage of the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery, the 14th Amendment providing citizenship and equal protection under the law, and the 15th Amendment providing African Americans with the right to vote. With the war over, what occurred on these islands was repeated throughout the South. Sympathetic Union officers, missionaries, and ex-slaves joined forces. They began the process of bringing education to the masses of African Americans. Reacting violently, Southern whites refused to accept that they had lost the war. They refused to accept citizenship and equal protection under the law for African Americans. And they refused to accept the education of African Americans. Bands of whites terrorized blacks and their white supporters. Harper's Weekly reported that a group of rioters burned a Freedmen's School in Memphis, Tennessee in May 1866. 
the acts of violence against the education of African Americans was repeated throughout the South. Yet, in the face of brutal opposition, these courageous women and men continued to teach. As part of Reconstruction, Congress established the Freedmen Bureau in 1865, headed by General Otis Oliver Howard. With the help of missionaries, the Bureau worked to establish schools. Teachers in these schools taught some 25,000 students of all ages in 4,000 schools across the South. These teachers were overwhelmingly women. A significant number were African American women. These black women demonstrated more commitment in terms of years served than any other group. Through this turbulent period arose many of the black colleges and universities institutions that continue to educate the majority of black college graduates today. Most of them began as elementary schools. Many of their founders were educated during slavery. They viewed education as the chief means to secure African American freedom and independence. Like Banneker, Douglas, Peake, and Fortin, the founders understood that educating oneself was the highest form of resistance to slavery and expression of freedom. The schools they established not only would eventually provide African Americans with medical doctors, lawyers, and ministers, but their primary role would be providing teachers, particularly for elementary education. In 1850, before the Civil War, only about 26,000 persons of color attended school. With the establishment of schools for African Americans in the South, by 1920, two million African Americans attended school. This effort to educate a people coming out of slavery is unmatched in the history of mankind. Amazingly, it was accomplished under oppressive conditions. Even more remarkable, it was accomplished for the most part by a poor and uneducated people. A people, Thomas Jefferson said, in imagination they are dull, tasteless, and anomalous. Soon after the war, these people, ex-slaves, began to find ways to build and establish schools for their children. After successfully starting a school, one ex-slave said, I rub my eyes and try to wake myself. When my boys and girls come home from school with their algebra, Greek, and Latin books, I say to myself, are these my children that were slaves a few years ago? Counted no more as cattle? One missionary said of her students, they begged for learning as a thirsty man would beg for a drink of water. These students returned home and shared their knowledge with their parents or would read the Bible to them. Despite the heroic effort of the missionaries and ex-slaves themselves, bringing education to a once enslaved and still despised people appeared to be insurmountable. Ooh, yeah. Once Reconstruction was over, white Southerners took control of state governments. They provided very little or no funding for the education of black children in comparison to what they provided for the education of white children. Unable to contest this discriminatory and unequal treatment, Booker T. Washington and others sought support from wealthy white industrialists in the North. Julius Rosenwald, one of these men of great wealth, was impressed with Washington and his work at Tuskegee Institute. Rosenwald asked Washington, what was the greatest need of the Negro people? Washington said, elementary schools. He realized, as educators realize today, that they had to provide children with a good elementary school education if they are to succeed in life. Rosenwald, a self-made man, had amassed a $150 million fortune in the mail order business and was chairman of Sears and Roebuck Company. He believed strongly in helping people help themselves, 
Thus, before he would contribute funds to build a school, the community itself had to raise a portion of the funds. Between 1914 and 1932, almost 5,000 rural schools called Rosenwald schools were built in the South, seating over 600,000 students. Blacks raised over 4.7 million. Southern whites contributed 1.2 million. Public taxes raised 1.8 million. And Rosenwald contributed 4.3 million. In addition, many times poor African American sharecroppers and tenant farmers provided the land, the building materials, and free labor. One Rosenwald agent recalled, I met with blacks in Greene County. They gathered in a little rickety building without heat. The majority were tenant farmers and had been hit hard by the boll weevil, causing tremendous damage to the cotton crop. As the meeting began, an ex-slave said, I want to see the children of my children have a chance, and so I'm giving my all. He slowly drew from his pocket an old grease sack and emptied his life savings on the table. This act inspired the audience. The agent writes that he first believed that these black sharecroppers could only raise about $10. At the close of the meeting, they had $1,365 on the table. By 1940, Hitler's armies from Germany were marching across Europe. Many young men who had attended these country schools were called to fight in a segregated army during World War II. Like the black veterans of the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, and World War I, World War II had a profound impact on them. Many vowed to fight against racism when they returned home. More importantly, many white Americans realized as a result of the Holocaust what the disease of racism could do if left unchecked. As a nation, it could not provide world leadership unless it addressed its own racial policies at home. Like Albert Einstein, more began to speak out. The new attitude in the country resulted in the historic Brown versus Board of Education decision, outlawing segregation in public education. The court cases encouraged many southern states to increase funding to black schools. These gestures, in many respects, were too little, too late. 300 years of slavery and 100 years of segregation had had a devastating and cumulative effect on the intellectual development of an entire group of Americans. A courageous few against overwhelming odds had sought to stem the tide of ignorance perpetuated by slavery and segregation. Most of their names have never appeared in history books. Yet, they fought the most difficult and critical battle of all, the education of an abused and despised people. Even with their heroic effort, the forces of ignorance, poverty, and racism left an enduring mark that lives with us today. Horace Mann Bond said the greatest sin of slavery and legal segregation was that it denied children a future when it denied them and education. He said, they have dragged their heavy burden of generations of enforced ignorance and wretched schools after freedom into the slum ghettos of the city, where many continue to be denied an education. He also reminds us that despite the great difficulties faced today in educating the African American child, like those before them, what teachers do today will pave an easier path for others tomorrow. James Anderson, another scholar on the history of education of African Americans, like Bond, also asked teachers, parents, and students to look to history for inspiration and answers in addressing today's educational challenges. Anderson reminds them that despite anti-literacy laws during slavery, African Americans and their white allies found a way to create an educated leadership. 
They provided leadership to African Americans when freedom came. Despite violence and segregation, they and their white allies closed the literacy gap. They taught the generation after slavery how to read and write. He therefore believes that educators today need not be discouraged by the next challenge, closing the achievement gap. Examples, research, and methods exist that provide direction in closing this gap. Like Bond and others, Anderson believes that the greatest weapon is a community of teachers, parents, and students who believe in the capacity of African Americans to learn, and a community willing to do what is necessary to make this happen. My mother said, I heard my mother say,